This week we're going to take a look at a, a slightly more complicated data set and look at a few more variables at once for our general linear model. So we have here the resilience and quality of life data set for Brazilian medical stu school students. I'm going to consider the, the quality of life measures to be outcomes and I've just picked psychological to look at here and then on your own you could look at perhaps social relationships or physical health or environment. And I've written outcome in there to make it clear what I'm considering the outcome. And we're looking at the rela relationship with resilience and I'm considering this to be the explanatory variable. We also have some other variables which you could look at if you want to go a bit further into the, ana into the analysis, but I'm not going to include too many today. I just want to keep it fairly simple. So what I'm most interested in um, is we'll just control for gender and we'll con control for group. And this is their year of study. So I had to quickly check the paper because I wasn't sure about what this meant. But we've got basic science, clinical science and clerkship. And it has to do with how far through their program they are. So if I just bring up the original paper. Um, so we've got some information here about the resilience assessment and the quality of life assessment. Often these are standardised questionnaires and similar across papers. Um, and uh, down under study variables we can see that basic sciences are the first and second year students, clinical sciences are the third and fourth year students and the clerkships are the fifth and the sixth year students. So it's a measure of how far through the program they are. So let's have a quick um, play with this data and see what we might do with it. So we've got their psychological outcome which has been um, based on a questionnaire and then transformed to lie between 0 and 100 where the higher score is the better outcome, I think. I better just check that, hold on. Uh, points in each domain are transformed to a score from 0 to 100 and the higher scores represent better quality of life. Uh, and then for the resilience, scores range from 14 to 98 interesting. I wonder why that is. Consisting of 14 items, maybe you can't score lower than zero. How odd. Um, so it's 14 to 98, so probably in practice a similar range to this one, um, and higher scores equal more resilience. So for both of them, the higher score is the better. So we've got two continuous variables here, so we could look at that with a scatter plot. We could also look at the correlation between the two, and we could run a a linear regression if that was appropriate. So let's have a look at a scatter plot. Did that click? Yep. I'll reset that. So we're going to put, I'm just going to extend this out so we can see this a little bit better. Oh, my little labels didn't show up. So our explanatory variable is the resilience score. So that would go on the x axis. And the outcome that we're interested in this case, I've chosen psychological quality of life. Um, you could choose something else. We're going to have that as the outcome. So that will go on the y axis. So it does look like we have a, a correlation here. It's not a perfect correlation. We've got one little outlier over there and someone who is not happy at all. Really? Zero? Zero psychological health. Huh. Um, and here we can see the, the cutting off at the, the 96 or the 98, whatever it was. Um, and the resilience is starting at 16, so the resilience isn't going all the way down to zero. Now you might notice with some data you get these bands forming and this isn't necessarily a problem. In this case, it's most likely happened because the actual score was lower. Um, I can't, it's, I've got like a two second memory at the moment. I can't remember what they said the scores ranged from, but maybe let's say up to 40. And then they did a little multiplication, a little transformation to have the scores lie between zero and 100. And it's created that this banding in the data. So I'm not really worried about that. If you have data where lots of dots fall on top of each other, you can jitter the plot. There's no tick box as far as I know for doing that in SPSS. What you need to do is actually get the code that's used to run the graph, add jitter in there, um, and then that will spread out the points a little bit more for you. And I can post that on the forum if anyone needs to know how to do that. So this is our simple um, scatter plot. 
We could also colour this scatter plot by a different variable, which is quite handy. So if I bring that back up again, and let's drag on the coloured one, and let's have a look first at gender. We can really only do one at a time. If you try to put more variables on a, on a graph, like more than three, it just tends to get very complicated and difficult to look at. So the blue is female and the red is male. So to me it looks like there's a possibility that the females are very, very slightly lower, but it's, it's incredibly difficult to read that when you've got so many different overlapping dots, but that will come out in the analysis. The other thing that we could um, colour by is the group. So this was the first and second year, third and fourth year and fifth and sixth year. And again, <laughs> really difficult to see because they've got um, so many overlapping dots. So let's have a look at how we would run the analysis to see if, we m I'm pretty sure we'll get a relationship and a straight line looks fine, doesn't look particularly curved. So I'm pretty sure we will get a relationship between psychological quality of life and the resilience score. But are there any differences between genders and the year of study? That's what we'll be interested in. So to run this, we're going to use the general linear model for all of these. The, there's a bunch of different ways you can do some of these things in SPSS, so I'm just going to pick a tool that we can use for lots of different situations. Our dependent variable is our psychological quality of life. Our main explanatory variable was our resilience score, and that's continuous, so that goes in the covariate box. Um, gender and group are both categorical and so they go in the fixed factors box. We're not covering random factors um, in this course so you can just leave that blank. Now let's not do anything else with this just yet. Let's just press OK and have a look at the output that we get. So we have here the output regarding the F tests and this will just tell us overall if there are differences um, so if any of the variables are significant, but it's not actually giving us the parameters if we, say, wanted to write out an equation to predict um, psychological quality of life based on these variables. So what we can see is uh, the intercept is not significant, and I'm actually not too concerned about that. Um, the resilience score is, and I would expect that. We could see that there was a, a trend upwards on the graph. It says there is a difference between the genders, so that might be interesting to explore a bit more. Um, 0.068, so there's possibly there is there are some differences between the groups and we don't quite have the sample size to pick it up in this study. Perhaps we need to control for a couple of other variables. But there's no interaction between genders and year of study. So there's not a different effect um, of year of study on the different genders. So that's what that's telling us there. So we might actually want to remove this interaction term and run the model again. And down here we've got our R squared term, and this is a measure of how much of the variation in the outcome, which in this case is the psychological quality of life, we can explain with our model, our model being all these variables here. So let's have a look at, this sample size seems huge. I'm sure it was different in the paper what they said they had. I must have read that wrong. Um, so where I said that might be due to sample size, I'm not so sure of that now. When I was looking at the paper, uh, we selected 60 students from each medical school. Oh, so they had a few medical students. I misread that as being 60 students in total, which is much less. So they've got a lot of students. Okay, so let's have a look at how we might take out this interaction term. So general linear model, univariate, and you can see that we didn't actually put in the interaction term. That's something that SPSS does automatically. It says, OK, you've got two um, categorical variables there. Let's see if they're interacting in some way. And an interaction in this sense is uh, exactly the same as how a drug interaction works, meaning that the let's say you're taking aspirin and it has a different effect based on whether or not you're taking um, I've lost my, your statins or some other medication. Um, in this case, does being in your your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth year of study have a different impact for the different genders? 
Now, we didn't, so we're not interested in that term. So we can take that out and that's underneath the model box. And you'll see here that by default it says full factorial model and that just means chuck everything in including all the interactions. Let's build the terms. So what I would like to do is I still want to keep all the variables but I just don't want the interactions. So we call that the main effects. So we're going to put in all our factors and covariates but just the main effects. Um, the intercept wasn't significant, but we can just leave that in. That's not really going to have too much bearing on the outcome, I think. The other thing that we might want to do is save the parameter estimates. And this will be your the column which has the B for the beta coefficients in it. So parameter estimates or coefficients, it's meaning the same thing depending on which um, test you're doing in SPSS. Now they do have a lot of other options here so if you've been reading up on effect sizes you could be uh, you could ask for that. We're going to do our own residual plots. I think that's easier uh, in terms of understanding than to do some of these ones here. So all I want to tick at the moment is there. But the other thing I want to do is to save our residuals. So let's save our our predicted values, the unstandardized ones. Um, we'll save both of these, even though I'm just to explain where they come from, I probably won't use both of them. So the unstandardized and the standardized. Continue, okay. So now with the output, we can see that we have our, our overall tests for each variable, that's our F test. But we also have our beta coefficients here. So if we wanted to write out an equation, we would be able to use these. And looking at these, it helps us work out it, where we've got um, two levels within a group, um, or two groups, fem males and females, which one is lower compared with the other. And then we could also do some, some plots to look at that. So we can see here that um, there is a significant difference between the genders and um, an association with resilience. Still not getting any difference between the different groups. So well, we might take that out as well. And there is, I'll take that out. Oh, did I take out the wrong one? Hold on. Now it took resilience out of the model. So if something goes weird, go back into your model and just check. All I did was take out the group, but it took out both of, both of them from the model. Okay, so now we've got resilience and gender. And they're both significant. The constant's not, but I'm not too concerned about this because I'm not actually going to use this to make any predictions. So when I say significant, meaning it's not significantly different from zero, meaning that we could run the model without an intercept and it'd probably be fine. Um, our R squared is still quite high, so we do have quite a strong relationship, I think, between the resilience and the psychological um, quality of life. So. If we have a look at these parameter estimates here, we can see that um, as your resilience goes up, your psychological quality of life is going up. Uh, not, by, not quite point for point. So for every increase of one in your resilience score, you get an increase of, on average, 0.79 for your psychological quality of life. And it looks like, on average, uh, females had lower psychological quality of life than the males. So they're our reference category and we have this adjustment downwards if you're female. And we should be able to see that on a graph if we um, do some means and confidence intervals. Um, what was I going to do? Oh, so let's do that first and then I'll come back and look at the residuals. So let's have a look at the... Um, So we're going to have a look at our psychological quality of life. Oh, I really just want a plain one. Uh, for gender. 
And this doesn't have our resilience anywhere on it. So we're just looking at this main outcome between the genders. And here we can see that the females are a bit lower than the males. So if I was going to use this graph, I might zoom in a little bit because we're, we're, we don't really need to show it from zero all the way up. Um, and if you wanted to have a look at the the year of study, if that was significant, you could you could do that as well. So I'm going to drop the coloured one back on and have a look at group as well. And there's no particular pattern there, but we can see that the females are lower than the males. Huh. So that that's interesting because it looks like there's no particular difference across year of study for the males. And this wasn't significant, but it looks there's a slight pattern here that perhaps the, the females are dropping down in the middle of their studies. Or that's just a bit of random variation coming out there because, as I say, that was not significant. The interaction between um, gender and group was uh, the p-value was 0.068, so we hadn't quite hit the significance level yet. But it's possible that there is a slightly different um, impact on women versus men in medical school. I think there is a fair bit of literature to back that up. So let's have a look at the residual analysis. So we have some assumptions for our general linear model. Um, and simply put, we're going to assume that we have captured all the important relationships in our model, meaning that the errors are random, that they're normally distributed, um, and that there's no significant outliers influencing them. And we're also assuming that there is a linear relationship between our resilience and our psychological quality of life. Similar to if we had a linear regression, we're assuming that's a straight line relationship. So if I go to our data view and you can see that we've got a few sets of residuals. So predicted one, residual one, standardised residual one, and then two, and then three. And that's because I had those boxes ticked and I ran the model three times. So you've got to be a little bit careful when you're doing this or else you'll end up with um, dozens and dozens of extra columns. So what I'm going to do is actually clear out the first ones and just have a look at my last set of residuals. So let me um, look at, so this was a quality of life. I'm just going to move this down so that we can have a look at what's going on and what these residuals mean. So this is uh, the first person's actual psychological quality of life score. They got a 50. Based on our model using resilience and gender, they would be predicted to have a resilience of, um, sorry, a psychological quality of life of 59. So the difference between their actual um, psychological quality of life score and their predicted value is uh, about nine. And then these residuals or errors can be standardized to that standard normal distribution which has a mean of zero and um, standard deviation of one. So it lies between uh, about negative three and three. And this is quite helpful because it makes it much easier to see if any of these values are outliers. So we're looking for outliers, we're looking to see if the residuals are normal and we're looking to see if there are any patterns or trends that we haven't captured or if they look approximately random. So the first thing that we could do here would be similar to what we do in, in any of our analyses where we're making the assumption of normality and that would be to do um, a histogram and a box plot. So let's do that. I'm going to reset this. Um, so our res I'm going to do our standardised residuals. I'm going to display the normal curve and if you're in the old version of SPSS make sure you click the OK button or the apply button and that's looking pretty good. Look at that sample size, that's enormous. Um, so we do have a tiny little blip here, I wouldn't be too worried about that. So it's looking normal. We could check for outliers if we were concerned. And there's some other fancier stuff, obviously, that you can do in SPSS, but we're doing just a basic analysis here. I don't want to get bogged down in too many of the options. So similar to what we've done before, we've used box plots to look for outliers. 
Um, and we do have a few down here, which we could see this little blip and a few up the top. Um, I'm not too worried about that. They're, on the whole, we've got such a large data set um, that having a few outliers at the bottom, I don't think is overly concerning. Apart from that person that had a score of zero, I, I think I might want to know a bit more about that, about how someone could score a zero. So if you remember back when we first did the, um, the scatter plot and we had this person here scoring the absolute bottom on resilience, which I th think was 16, mm, or maybe they got an 18, but they're zero on the psychological quality of life. So did they actually score a zero or did they just not fill out the survey because um, I bet you they're an outlier. So we've had a look at normality, we've had a look at outliers, and now we might look to see if we've sort of captured the patterns or if there are any um, trends left over. And the easiest way to do this is to look at, do another scatter plot and have a look at what the errors are along the, the predicted values. So what we would do is put the predicted values on the x-axis and put our errors on the y-axis. Now what will this will normally do, and I think I have some examples in the notes, is typically if there's any curvature or um, curvy patterns in the data, you'll, you'll see it here. And if there's increasing or decreasing variance, you'll typically see this in this plot as well. So sometimes it's helpful to put a reference line on this graph. So I'm going to put a reference line at, oh it's coming at zero. Let's make it red. So we're looking to see are the residuals randomly scattered about. Um, we have this banding ha happening and this was just an artifact of, of how the um, psychological quality of life was measured. I'm not really too concerned about that. Um, we have slightly more variation in this upper end than we do down here, but we also have a lot more people who are falling in this higher end than down there. So there's a, I would say there's a very slight increase in variance, but that's not enough that would concern me. Um, and you could look in the lecture notes for an example of, of what a big increase in variance might look like. So these were our predicted values for the psychological quality of life. These are our standardised residuals. You could use your raw residuals. You'll get the same patterns coming out as your standardised residuals. It's just that they can be, um, in terms of interpreting whether or not something is large, it's helpful to know that they should mostly be lying between um, 3 and negative 3. So if you wanted to, you could also put a reference line in at 3. Let's colour it blue. That's not three. Oh, I didn't click apply. There we go. And we could put another one in at negative three if we wanted to. Just as a rule of thumb because anything outside of those bounds would be considered quite a large residual. I feel like I used a different shade of blue. That looks darker. So these were our outliers that we could see on the histogram and it looks like we've got one there. But that's actually not too bad considering the amount of data we have there. So that's a simple analysis of our this one outcome of psychological quality of life. If you want to have a bit more of a play with the data you could go through and you could try controlling for age, which is possibly related to the year of study or the group that they're in. Perhaps you could look for associations with some of these other variables, state anxiety, trade anxiety, um, perhaps, um, or oh, legal status, I wonder what that is. Oh, public and private. I don't really know anything about the um, school system in Brazil so public or private that might be interesting have a look at that 
And then if you're comfortable with that analysis, you could try looking at a different outcome and do the whole thing again, perhaps looking at social relationships or physical health.